You're listening to a Pop House Network podcast for developers by developers. Welcome to Java Pop House episode 94. <laughs> Essentially, uh, what we call this? Data dumps? Heat dumps. Heat dump analysis. Yeah. Yes, yes. All right. So, um, Hello, everyone. Um, you know, this is our you know ninety fourth episode, last episode of twenty twenty. Um, you know, my name is Freddie Gime. I'm one of the co-hosts of the Java Pop House. I'm one of the um, authors, speaker, um, Java champion uh, in in you know Seattle Java User Group. You know, uh, co organizer, and I'm here with my usual suspect, Bob. Everybody, Bob Pollan, independent consultant from Chicago, uh, Apache Software Foundation member, Java champion, uh, and C Jug board chair for the the second year running. So, all right. And before we dive in, we wanted to uh, thank our sponsor. Our sponsor is uh, for this episode is Datadog. Today's show is sponsored by Datadog, a monitoring and analytics platform that integrates with over four hundred technologies, including AWS services, Docker, and Kubernetes. Datadog's platform brings together metrics, traces, and logs in one place so you can get full visibility into your environment and improve your application performance. With machine learning based alerts, customizable dashboards, and distributed tracing, Datadog makes it easy to unify disparate data sources so you can troubleshoot faster. Start your free Datadog trial today. Listeners of this podcast will receive a free t shirt once you install the agent and create one dashboard. Visit javapophouse.com slash datadog to get started. Again, the URL is javapophouse.com slash datadog. And we thank them for their support on this podcast. They make sure that they keep the mics on and recording and the screen sharing going on. So and the beer cold. <laughs> oh, the beer cold. Very important. That's the fuel that fuels this podcast. That's right. I'm, I'm <laughs> drinking my traditional winter one, the, the North Wind from Two Brothers, if you remember that one. Oh, I'm so jealous. As you uh, should be. You know, once <laughs> once travel opens up, we'll be able to. I'll be able to travel to Chicago, and and we'll record one classic pub house episode back at 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 the Roundhouse, which is where we all started in episode like you know one. So so that's fun. Um, all right, so let's 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 get into it. Uh, so heap dumps, right? Yeah, no, heap dump. So, I mean, Freddie, I know, what was it? Probably, I, I don't want to date this too much, but is it seven years now, that, seven years ago that you had a talk yeah. on heap dump analysis <laughs> that you gave at the C-Jug that eventually we ended up, I think that's one we took to Java one at one point. Um, yeah, but, yeah, we did. Um, and, you know, that, that talk was more on GC pressures and mm -hmm. it was, um, you know, we were still running on, I, I don't even know if we were on Java 8 at that point. Yeah, um, we were just a, starting. We were yeah. just starting off. But, uh, you know, a lot has happened since then. Um, you know, there's improvements in tooling. Uh, so we wanted to kind of revisit the topic of heap dump analysis, even though it, I think it is memory is, is a topic we've covered in the past. Uh, mm -hmm. But to kind of go more into the details of how do you do it, what are the things you can do with it? Because I think it's one of the most underutilized techniques in production support and debugging um, and how to navigate some of the tools just, just in detail. Now that we're, we do video, we can actually show our audience so a little know, bit of, of with our screens of, of, of how we use these tools and, and how you can you know, use some of the techniques that we use. Uh, to improve your debugging skills and 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 uh, you know just be more useful in those. Hey, we're on the call, and we'd <laughs> like to get off the call to go to bed or or to celebrate our holidays. Yeah. Um, you know, be the be the person that finds the bug. In other words, no, yeah, and and, and so th there's there's a tons to to like unpack there, right? Like like the very first thing is that that. People tend to be afraid of heap dumps, right? Like, like, like it's like, oh my gosh, I got a heap dump. Now what do I do, right? Like, and and, and this episode is to give you, like, a, a, you know, sort of like a safety blanket, you know, because the best thing that you can do is to actually be able to collect a heap dump. Like, if there is a production incident, you know, is it's it's essentially like, it, like the way I like to think about it is like like that's a smoking gun, right? Like, yep. like if if you manage to get a heap dump, the answer will be there, 
Like it might be, you know, like for for if you never looked at a heat dump before or like or in trade nights, it might be like daunting. But once you know what you're looking for, you can solve the problem in like five seconds. Like you open up the heat dump and you're like, oh, that's what it was. And then when you look at the code, it's like, oh, it makes perfect sense. Right. So 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 the very first thing is is do not be afraid of heat dumps. Is there anything heat dumps are your friends? These are essentially the closed circuit TV cameras of the production world where you can try to replay or figure out what happened, right? And and, and they will make sure that 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 you can actually fix it in a timely manner and then, then get it out there. Now Yep. And the, and the other thing I would just even add to that is is just some of the other cases that you you'd want it is a lot of the times you don't own the code that you're trying to debug. Right. And one of the unique things that you get out of a heap dump is even the classes that you don't control the source code from, you're mm-hmm. going to be able to see state. You're going to be able to see what those class names are. You're going to be able to see what those uh, cl- what those classes are doing to maybe some of the open source libraries uh, that are being used. Um, so the, the heap dump goes well beyond just garbage um, memory allocation problems. It can be one of those tools you can use uh, to check your assumptions about the state of the, the state the system is actually in versus the state that everybody on the call thinks it's in. Oh yes, yes. Because when there's when the, when it goes to crickets on a on a production support call, usually it's not because you know the people on the call don't know what's going on. It's usually because everybody on the call has the wrong assumption. And yep. it's just figuring out which assumption that you're making that's actually wrong. Essentially, heap dumps don't lie, right? They don't lie. <laughs> that is, that is I, I am sure true. that I said 200 gigs of memory. It's like, no, yes. it's here that you did only one. <laughs> I set that timeout to five seconds, and it should have timed out by now. Why is it staying open for three minutes? Yeah. Oh. Heap dump doesn't lie. <laughs> and we'll get into how, how, to, how to determine that in this episode. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, um, we, so why not, uh, the, the should last, we start with what is, oh, go ahead, Freddie. I was going to say, the, the, maybe, maybe this, is, this is where you wanted to go. Um, I wanted to first start with what, like a memory leak, a little bit of a history of memory leaks, what they are, and, and how they happen, right? Because a heat dump allows you to find those very quickly. And, and, and so, so for, for those who, who, you know, and, and this is a strange concept. If you are new to the Java developing language, one thing that they say is like, oh, there's no memory problems. Like there's, you know, and, and it's a half truth. It's, it's, it's like, um, like, you know, like Maybe sometimes- Maybe a quarter truth, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so there are things that happen, right? Like we, we've been living in a world where there's new software developers that are coming into the market that never really have to allocate or deallocate or a memory. Maybe they just always started on Java. They they never went, they always being on a managed language and they never had to do this on their hand. But before before the revolutionary that Java was, like the way that, that memory allocation worked is that you have to create memory for variables, essentially saying, you know, if you have an array, if you have something that you wanted to survive the stack or the local scope, you have to say like, hey, you know, uh, you know, uh, processor, you know, OS, I need this many bytes of memory. And the processor will go in and allocate some memory for you and say like, look, this is a handle to it. You tell me when you're done with it and I'll essentially, you know, deallocate it. And the way a lot of like, like this started back in C and C++ where, where you have to sort of like, you allocate, you have to be very careful and do things like reference counting and stuff. And when you're done with the memory that you have in an array or on the variable, you say, you know, you essentially call the alloc or whatever it is that the OS will let you say like, okay, I'm done with this. You know, you can, you can release it to the web. Now a memory leak is essentially when you forget to do one of those things, when you say like, for example, you allocated something and you forgot to deallocate it. And, and then what that happens is if this is like an, an inner loop, if this is something that happens on a constant you know, timer or if it happens because a request is coming in or something like that, what happens is you keep allocating this all the way until you get, a, you, you, know, you consume all the memory of your host operating system and that's an out of, out of memory, you get an out of memory exception. Now this used to happen on C++. In Java, you know, a lot of the things that we're freed up is is the, this idea that we have to allocate the memory for an object and deallocate it. Most of the time, essentially all the time, 
um, the JVM will allocate anything that you you ask it to. So 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 essentially, you create a new object array, it will allocate it, and then if you create a new you know whatever it is, a new a new integer, a new object, a new new byte array, all of that is allocated through the actual JVM you know abstractions. And then the JVM then keeps track of how you're using this object. And the moment that it that it that it does what is you know escape analysis or figures out, oh nobody can actually reach to this object anymore, meaning that this object is being done, being used, then it sort of like says, okay, this is a candidate for garbage collection. And then it puts it like in the little flag in there on the object header where it says, okay, this this could be a place where we need to look at on the next sort of like garbage collection cycle that we run. So what happens is th there is almost for the normal cases that like you allocate and deallocate things. Um, you know the JVM is going to take care for the, uh, of that for you, and that's a great thing because you never have to worry about it. You never knew that this was happening behind the scenes. But the JVM is always looking for when you're done using something, it is time to say like you know since nobody can actually really reach this object, I can just get rid of it. Now, the big caveat that happens is that there can be memory leaks on Java. And the reason that they happen is because, you know, we allocate something, but we keep using it or we keep it what is called strongly referenced to our main program. And when, it, when, when strongly referenced means is that you put it on, on sort of like a map, you put it on a, an array list, or you put it as a member of another object that is always reachable, you know, from any other part of your system. Yeah. And so, I mean, let, let's pause right there just to let the audience keep catch up because it, you, yeah. you said a lot. So oh, gosh, let's, yeah. let's go through an example of if, if I have a main, a static void main entry method. And within that method, I define, you know, a new object of foo. Mm -hmm. And that reference to foo is in the, is in the main method. So it's like there, defined. At, yeah. it's defined at the start of the program. So the scope of that object is the main method. So as long as the main method is running, that object is going to be strongly referenced from the main class, which mm -hmm. means that object is likely not going to get garbage collected until you stop the program. Yep, yep. Um, but let's say I have a for loop where I define a variable um, that's used in there that's, let's say that's bar, as I go through the for loop, that bar attribute that I define in there is only going to live for the scope of that one cycle of the loop because it's defined within the scope of the loop. So that object is mm -hmm. going to get created. And then at the end of it, it's still going to be there, but there's no strong reference to it anymore right? At the end of that loop. Now, some of this, you also mentioned escape analysis, which goes down a whole other, other rat holes as well. <laughs> Could it be optimized where we're putting these on the stack too? Yep, Maybe yep. for another episode. Yes. But conceptually, that's what you're talking about when you're talking about strong references between objects. Mm -hmm. You know, A lot of it has to do with where it's scoped and whether from that main program while it's running, can, could I still call a method on that object read a variable from that object, that means it's strongly referenced and that can't be garbage collected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what like, like for example, or if you have like a static, sort of like a static map, right? Like those are yes. globally referenced across, you know, all parts of your program. And, 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 and so those are the ones that you have to watch out for too as well, right? Like, so like that, it can be bad. It can be evil, right? <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, and, and that's the whole point where, where the thing is that if you keep adding to a map or adding to these structures and the, they never become, you never really prune them or remove any of them. And then like the objects that you add keep being strongly referenced. Um, the garbage collector or the JVM cannot really say like, oh, you're keep adding it, but I don't think you're going to use it. It cannot make that decision because, like, it could be that you are doing something with it that you want to do something at the end of of, of, of running main where you count things, right? So, so the the garbage collector would not be able to say like, "Oh, these things are candidates for collection." And then what happens is that if you keep adding to a map and you never remove, and the map is something that it that is sort of like not necessarily local to like a small method or local to a for loop, it's something that it might be like using globally. Then, then that is where the, the, the danger comes. It always just to have a warning signal. If you're adding to a map and never removing, and the map is something that you use everywhere, then that you could have a potential memory leak. Because what happens is JVM cannot decide to prune this map. It doesn't know how. 
because it doesn't know what your intentions for it. So we'll keep just keeping the records in there. And then at some point in time, like everything else, you know, like uh, that that map runs out of memory or you cannot locate more and you get the the dreaded out of memory exception. And then the your JVM starts starts falling down. One of the things that you actually see as it's it's because it, it, we we've seen it in production the slow dying death when it tries well, to here, let me collect. let me share my screen because <laughs> I think that's the perfect segue, segue. <laughs> to to that. So let me do a quick share here, and this is this is a J Council screen capture that I have uh, of a, of a memory leak essentially in the program that we're going to analyze tonight. So yeah. I mean. As you can see, everything's going up and down, up and down, but you look at that trend line, right? So there's yep. garbage collectioning happen, but every single time it collects, it keeps rising. That bottom line keeps rising. Yes. And that is that is a telltale sign that there is something that we're that there is a memory leak, which in the Java terms means that we are adding a strongly referenced thing. And we're never letting the garbage collector be able to collect it because it's still strongly referenced, even though we might be done with it, right? So, 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 th and and that is that is just like, like you know, like if you go through your production systems and you see the trend line going that way, that is a strong sign that says there might be a leak somewhere in that program. Yep. So let's talk through it. So we, we've kind of defined the problem. And this is, again, if you, if you have an APM, if you're debugging something locally and you see this kind of a trend line on your heap, what, what's the next step? So, I mean, naturally as an engineer, how do I find out what's causing this? Yes. So, 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 so the, the interesting part is, is like, you know, and, and this is, the, the, the wrong way to do it, or not necessarily the wrong way to do it, but the, the, the first way that, that jumps in is like, oh, you start looking at all the code, right? Like, like I've done that, where it's like, oh my gosh, the first time I panic, I saw the trend line, it's like, let me look at the code and sort of like try to see where it is. But, but you know, and it could be that you can find it, but really the correct way to get to this is to actually get a heap dump. A heap dump, like, like we said, never lies and will immediately tell you uh, where is the memory being used? Yep. So, I mean, let's let's talk through what is a heap dump. So, a heap dump, essentially, um, and this is the scary part why, why I think people avoid heap dumps, is heap dumps do pause the JVM uh, while they're running. Yes. So, it does not allow the state of the JVM to change uh, while it's running. And, there, and if you have a very large heap, let's say a 24 gigabyte heap, it could take a yeah. minute to minutes. run and yeah. dump a 24 gigabyte file on your hard drive. So, you know, there, there's concerns around, hey, do I have the hard drive space for this? There's concerns about pausing something when it's running in production. But usually if you're headed towards this state, you're headed towards the system crash. locking up. And you know what? It, it is, at that point, it is worth it to take the dump before the system crashes because otherwise it's gonna crash, you're gonna start over again and you're gonna start from that first square without any idea of what's going on. Uh, yeah. So when you're in this situation, get the drive space. If you have to mount an additional hard drive, do it, but get the space, take the heap dump, take the pause. It mm -hmm. will be worth it. Yeah. Um, so, and what it's going to do is it's going to output all of the classes. So it's going to go through the heap and every single class that's in the heap and depending on your options, whether it's garbage collected or, or is still alive will be included. So you can even include stuff that's there that's not reachable. Yeah, um, it's like yeah, ready for yeah. collection, but not collected yet. Not collected yet. So, I mean, you can get the entire heap, um, even things that would not be visual, visual, uh, reachable from the running program. Um, and it's going to write that to disk, and it's going to write it in a format with all the classes, all the state and all of those classes. Um, and that heap dump, while it's very large, can be parsed using visual tooling um, in order to be essentially navigate the state of the system at that one point in time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, is there anything I'm missing in there, Freddie, with, that you would add to like, what is a heap dump? Yeah, no, I, I, I think that uh, the, the fun part is that a heap dump also will walk, will walk the tree. And by walking the tree, it will tell you like, oh, look, this particular object is being strongly referenced by this object, which is strongly referenced by this object. And sometimes you get to see it like it's strongly referenced by a thread in main. 
which which then gives you like an idea like oh this is how the whole thing was sort of constructed or or the reason like like it does not just tells you what the heptum has but it also like tells you like what the JVM says like I cannot garbage collect this because this yeah. is where where the object is being used so so these are all incredibly useful tools to try to nail down where the leak or or where what is the story is on on, on what's happening. But that's interesting too, because you do you can trace it back to things like which thread is this running in. Yep. Um, so you do get all the metadata that's attached to those objects. So um, tons of information. Um, so yeah, no, I think that that captures it pretty well as as to what is a heap dump. So I, I guess the next step is well, uh, you know, how how do I take one? And if I look at my screen here, um, there's a couple different ways to to do it, but they all kind of start with the same uh, process. Uh, the very first way is you're going to want to find what, what your Java PID is, so the process idea of your process. So I can get that. So I have a, a small Spring Boot application running here. So oh, let's say, like, are you sharing your screen? Yeah, you're sharing your screen. I should be, yeah. yep. So I can just type J, JPS and hit enter, and it will tell me what the PID is of the Spring Boot process. So I've also got my Eclipse running. I've got a few other things running, mm -hmm. um, but I can get the process ID. Yep. Yep. Once I have the process ID, uh, I can use that to run a JMAP command. So if I want to run this from command line, let's say I'm going into a server, um, so I don't have any of the visual tools on that machine. And, and honestly, in production, why would I want to run the visual tools yeah. on the machine in production? But I can take the the the, the dump by calling JMAP uh, dash dump. There should actually be a colon here. Oh, I guess it depends on like what. Yeah. And I'll go into why. Um, format should be binary. Um, I don't know that they're, I've never used anything but binary. Yeah, so I know. honestly, they have this format option. Everybody but you uses have binary, to specify so, it, but, yeah, but you do have to provide it. So it is, yeah. it is required. And then you can provide a path to where you want to save the file. Um, and again, these are large files. So often, you know, if you have a large mount or something, you're going to specify a path to that. And then you're yeah. going to specify that PID that you got from the JPS command. Now, the, the, before you dive in, um, the one thing I wanted to say to everyone is that the beauty of, of what Bob is going through is that both JPS and JMAP are things that are coming as part of the JDK. Yeah. So, so, so these tools are probably already on the production servers that you might need to troubleshoot. So, so you know, unless you're using a very, very light, lightweight version of the JRE, you will always have like a JMAP and, and a JPS ready for you at your fingertips on 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 the machine that you that is actually a little bit sick. And if it isn't, then then that's something that you definitely want to add because the cost is nothing to have those tools in there, and and you know the 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 the, the upside of having them if you need them is incredibly high. So. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. So, I mean, it's, it's the upside is, is larger than the security risk of having someone break into the server and run them and pause your, your systems. Um, you know, you should be defending your systems better. Yeah. Uh, your counsel then, better if, yeah. if that's the, if that's the reason the you're not risk. doing it. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that's, that's the by hand option. Now the, the, the colon I have after dump, there is another option you can specify there. So uh, when I mentioned I want everything. If you just do dump colon, you get everything, even objects that are there that are going to be garbage collected, but are not yet. But if I know I don't care about them and let's say I'm trying to save space or, um, you know, I'm, I'm worried about the pause time of, of having all these garbage collected objects be recorded. I can do colon live after dump. And what that's going to do is it's only going to drop the objects that are traceable from their GC root, so they're still alive and traceable in the program, into the heap dump. Mm -hmm. Removing all the things that will have been collected uh, anyway. So. Correct. So you might have some difference in, hey, what the heap size says to what the garbage uh, uh, or what the, uh, the, the profile or the uh, HPROF file that you dumped. Uh, but again, it's one way to save space if you know like, hey, I'm going hit to the, hit the roof with this thing if I don't. Um, yep. and, and then on top of that, you know, if you are running local, um, there are UI tools like Matt and J Visual VM, which we're going to be demoing today, that also have GUI support for taking heap dumps. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other way that I didn't even put in our our, um, our format is or our uh, our format is that you can also use JMX to do it. 
if you have access to the JMX council, there's a, there's an activated, uh, there's a take keep dump. Uh, oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, and that will be like the the way to do it. Like, if if you don't even have access to like a shell on the machine, uh, and you can only do like you know JMX commands to the production server. Sometimes that that tends to happen, uh, but that will be your you know another way that you can actually get get a heat dump. It will be in the local somewhere, and then some admin will have to go and extract it. But it's better than that you know it's, it's definitely something you can do if you don't even have access to ssh yep absolutely um, and and a lot of the the you know kind of current platforms i know um platforms like carafe and spring boot have mm-hmm. built-in heap dump tools like in spring actuator you can call an api to get a heap dump if you're trying to get it off of a kubernetes cluster where it's like hey i don't have space yep. bound to this can we just stream it over the network Carafe has it through command line where I can run it and pull it out from SSH off of the, the Java uh, OSGI runtime. So, I mean, a lot of platforms have it built in. And when you look at how the platforms do it, usually they're using the JMX stuff under the covers, programmatically yeah. calling JMX mm-hmm. platform. So w- there's no excuse not to be able to get a heap dump <laughs> as there's so many different ways to get it. Just pick yep. the flavor that, that works for you and your, and your instance. So um, let's, do an example. Are we ready to, to look at a heat? Yeah, dump? let's do this. Let's do this. So, so excited. Um, I developed a small Spring Boot app, just, just a very, very simple one um, that has, you know, it's stateful, so it has sessions. It's just a simple REST interface um, that I can call. I can create sessions. I can retrieve things from sessions. I can call an API. Um, so it's just got a, a little bit of logic in it. And uh, like any heat dump, I've hit it with some load. So I sent about a bench. A, I used <laughs> Apache Bench, which is a tool that comes with the Apache uh, web server. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you if you have a build of the Apache web server, you probably have Apache Bench, um, and I use that to run uh, basically a call to that to the session endpoint uh, a million times just to just to see what would happen, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so this added some load. This ran over the course of probably about fifteen minutes or so, um, and gave us our you know, our, our garbage color, our heap memory usage of death line where it just mm-hmm. is ever increasing. So we know we have a problem here and, and anybody that's worked in Java EE knows probably what this problem is. <laughs> um, and if you're I'm, using sessions for your stateless APIs, you've probably seen this probably very recently. <laughs> yeah. And this is, this is JIT console, right? Which is, yes. which is also an, uh, is, it is a visual tool that is part of the JDK uh, and and it again like everything else comes comes directly prepackaged with the JDK version yeah. usually. Yeah, and I can get in and and do a number of the, some of the hotspot diagnostics when we were talking about hey dump peep here's the actual ah operation. there it is Since I have it up yeah. I can yeah. I can fire this away and just and invoke it without any other tools or command line options. So this is kind of our profile. Um, so let's take a look at it. So I've got it up in Matt. Um, I think Freddie, you've got it up in J uh, visual VM. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you open up a heap dump, I mean, basically you click fire uh, file. And, and since I already took it through the command line option, I basically just kept click open. And then I, I click on the H prof file. So that yeah. opens this heap dump for me and it'll run some analysis for you out of the, out of the box. Um, so this is the overview page that gets generated from that. And like Freddie said, right off the bat, you can usually tell what the problem is almost immediately. Um, we see here, we have a single object, biggest objects by retain size is the standard, uh, the session manager. Um, so we, we just threw a million requests that we're all creating sessions. So, um, not a huge surprise, but if I want to dig into this a little bit, uh, deeper, I can also generate a leak suspect report. Um, so I can click that and that's going to go through the heap dump and it's going to generate a a more drilled down, uh, version, um, of this, uh, scene where it's going to show, okay, here's my problem suspect a, it's going to give me what the name of the class is. It's going to say what class loader loaded it. It's going to say how many bytes. It's 95% of my memory are these sessions. And it's also going to give me some of the instances that are within it. 
um, mm-hmm. in order to provide me some, some more detail. So this is, um, if we look at this, this is essentially your uh, your path. This is this is your path to your uh, your GC your route, route right here. Yep. So I can see it's the application shutdown hook that is holding onto it. So this is stuff that may like not go away. Job, yeah until the application stops. Now it's a session. So usually there's expiration times associated with it, but um, without any of that logic in there, these objects have the potential to stick around for a very long time. Um, so that's, uh, that's the, the leaks report. I can also look at the top components. Um, this will go and just show a, a more detailed view um, of all the objects through the what's known as the histogram view of it. So it, it's actually going to give you a list of all the objects within the heap dump, as well as the percentages of how much that they're taking up uh, of the heap. Um, so this one takes a little longer because it's going through all of it, but I can pop open a, a version of this. Um, let's see, do I have? No, I don't have this one open yet. Um, but this is the histogram view. So essentially, I can look at this and see, okay, I've got a bunch of characters in memory. And I have these two, con- these, these two things, the shallow heap, which are objects that are pretty much directly referenced through the object. And I can also look at a retained heap, which goes many layers deep to say, okay, this object is referencing this object and this object yep, and this yep. object. Um, how much size does that take up? As a whole, as a now, whole. Yep. it gives you estimates off the bat rather than trying to calculate all that off the bat because it can be computationally expensive. But these usually end up being pretty close. Um, if I want to get more exact things, I can go in and, and actually ask it to calculate a precise retained heap size if, I, if I'm worried about the estimates. Uh, but frequently, I can get what I want out of this. And here again, I see the session as one of my top things. I can search and, and kind of... Uh, pair things down uh, with the search tool. Oops, my uh, component report oh, CC. is on. So I can look at this at a more report type view if I want to. Uh, biggest objects overview. So this gives me the, again, the, the session is is my big one here. You know, what the classes and the dominator view, and we'll look at that in just a second. Um, so we've only got one session manager, but again, that one object is holding on to things that take up over 95% of the heap. Uh, but let's go back to the histogram. So I can search. Um, if I know which class I'm looking for, I can just type it in and it will wildcard it for me and get everything with session. Mm-hmm. Now, if I want to drill into this and say, well, you know, there's only one, uh, you know, there's only one session manager, but we have all these sessions. What are in these sessions? I can also go to this list object view and look at the sessions with their outgoing references. So this is the session object and all the things that it's referencing. So the things underneath it by clicking with outgoing references. So now I have a list of all my sessions. So I have over a million of these, but I can click into here and this gives me all of the objects that are res- referenced through the standard session object. So a standard session is, is your Java EE session, which is essentially a big concurrent hash map at the end of the day. And we can actually see, hey, here's the big concurrent hash map that we're storing all of our session attributes in, um, in a Java EE session. So I can click into here if I want to find out what's in the session. I can drill down into this concurrent hash map. I can see, oh, there's a, there's a hash map in here and a table with a node. And within here, I have an integer is the the key value. And the value of the string is just this random string that I'm generating um, in the code. And again, like if I'm working with vendor code, let's say this is WebSphere, let's say this is um, something that I'm paying money for that I don't have access to the source, all of this information is still available to me. It's still gonna show up. They can't, the, the vendors can't hide this from me. So it's, it's an extremely useful tool for dealing with proprietary things that run on the JVM as well. Um, but I can go in and say, okay, I've got these, these strings. You know, is it the same one? Is it a different one? And that can help me determine, you know, are there things that I can do to, to shrink this down to get rid of this, uh, to get rid of this problem? Um, so in here, I can go down and I can see, okay, hash map, this is a different session. All right, I've got a different key here, but I can see looking at these strings, 1986, and again, this is just guesstimating. 
I can look and see, hey, you know, this is the same exact string that are in each one of these. You know, could this be a candidate for, say, string deduplication or something like that if I wanted to try to, to shrink this down, which is available on some of the later JVMs? Yeah, um, yeah, just right. by interning it, for example. Um, let me see. What else did I want to cover? So we, we talked about leaks. We talked about shallow and uh, showed the histogram. Now, what if I want to trace it up? So say, okay, I, I know that it's the session, but what is actually holding on to the session? Like what, how can Why I get rid it? of these sessions? Yeah. Yeah. You know, because something should be dereferencing this and getting rid of it. If I wanna to try to find that, instead of looking at the outgoing references, I can look at the incoming references and then I'm working at things that are referencing this object. So if I click here and I have the session, it has the same look to it, but I'm going in the other direction. So now I see this session facade, which is holding onto this session and I, can, and I can go up until I reach probably the session manager or I, I may end up getting all the way to the GC route. Uh, no, this looks like oh, it might wow. be just going in circles here. And that sometimes happens too. It's, yeah, it's like self-referencing. It's self-referencing. Self um, yeah, the value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the easier, so let's, let's actually just actually trace the GC route directly then instead. Um, so if I want to get to a, a GC route, I can just click here, path to the GC route with all references. And that should give me, here we go. Now I can trace it all the way from the standard session it's, going, it's also going back to that application shutdown hook. Um, so I can see all the classes that are referencing it in between. It's like, okay, so the standard session manager is, has a concurrent hash map of all these concurrent hashback nodes, which hold the standard session. So basically there is a big hash map yeah, that's within huge. Java EE that holds all the sessions. Um, so, okay, now if I wanted to figure out, you know, how Java EE works, I could go through Java EE code if I didn't know how it worked already. Um, and I could find out, hey, there's expiration time on these sessions, or maybe, hey, I don't actually need sessions, and this should be a stateless API call. And then I remove this from the call, um, and then I'm back to a more memory neutral setting. Um, but these are, these are some of the things that you can uh, just get at it. I mean, I can, I can look... Um, if I want to look at different things in the class hierarchy, I can see which class loader loaded it. So if you're dealing with an OSGI container and you're trying to figure out, say, you know, which class loader is loading it, I can trace this back to potentially a bundle um, or something along those lines. Um, you know, and there's, uh, I'm trying to remember if there's a way to get at the threads too. I feel like there is a way to get at the threads too from here um, that we talked about before. Uh, let's start at the histogram. So I could show objects by class. So there's, there's only a single class of these. Um, thread details, here we go. Ah. So what this is gonna do is it's, I should probably actually have only clicked this on one instance of it. It's probably gonna go and find thread details of all of them. Let me, let me go back to my uh, objects. So let's look mm -hmm. at the thread details of, of this guy here. So I've got, uh, da, da, da. oops, my, I might be wrong about that. I may have to do that through the, uh, through the top, through the top level. Um, that's what I get for shooting from the hip. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's look at the, the class tree again. Object class, outgoing references. And then I can go to Java Basics. Let's do, me. Just do thread. Oh, no. Nope. Let's do thread. I was trying to make it run a little faster. We'll do the thread details and see if that finishes soon. Um, mm -hmm. But while that's running, I mean, so I can get at a number of different things uh, about these objects. Now, the other thing um, while that's running that's useful is let's say I had a uh, API that uh, was being proxied through this application. So it was calling something with an HTTP client mm -hmm. um, and it was taking forever. Um, and, you know, everybody on the call is saying, well, 
we have timeouts set for everything. Why, you know, it should have ended in, in five seconds, but you know, one of them is, is taking forever. Well, I can go back to my histogram and if I know which class I might be using, like let's say I wanted to use, look at the HTTP client, let's say it's using the Apache HTTP mm -hmm. client, I can pull that in and I can see um, my internal HTTP clients. Now, yeah. if I click on this, I can see there's two instances. So, well, what does that look like? Um, so I can say, oh, give me the outgoing references and I can click this one. And within here, you know, if I know how Apache works, I can look at my default config and say, uh, whoops, uh, now I'm just clicking on stuff and it's blowing up. Oh, there's my thread details. It's finally happened. Um, so I can <laughs> see different thread properties and the different threads that are running. So these don't actually have names, but there's probably a million of them. And that's why it's taking up 14, yep. 15 gigs of my memory at this point, And it's <laughs> freezing my screen. Uh, so Freddie, you want to talk about <laughs> J visualizer. It might be a good time to do that while this is catching up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me share my screen. I mean, uh, All right, oh. I'll stop sharing, then I'll get back to the HTTP client. Uh, yeah. And I think that, that, um, that for us, it's like, uh, you know, Visual VM, uh, a little bit of story about Visual VM. It used to be um, a separate project. Uh, you know, it was an open source project. Uh, it started on its own. And then for a while, um, you know, the, the, it was bundled with the uh, JDK. So, like, if you were working on, on Oracle JDK 8, you'll find it there. Oracle JDK 11, you'll find it there. Uh, but at some point in time, uh, when it became to, like, Open JDK, they sort of, like, split up again, right? And it's not part of the um, bundle as it used to be. You can still download it on its own, and you can still use it, uh, you know, you know, like independently, um, but it is just another tool that allows you to see like what's going on, right? Like so, and it's essentially the same thing where, where um, let's see, we can actually, I'm on the object references, where are you? Just one second, details preview, no. Let me do this again. Uh, let me just reopen it. I'm just going to close it and reopen it so you can see like the summary and stuff just like we did before. So, so same with, with, with Bob's, you get sort of like a, like a big, um, you know, summary where, you know, you can see the size is two gigs, number of classes, number of instances that are there, you know, some of the interesting stuff that, that can help you. Like I say like, Ooh, which Java Home was it we using? And like, um, you can actually say like same deal, like, you know, uh, dominators by size in this case is pointing to a hash map node, which means that there's a map there that is sort of like keeps accumulating without evicting, right? And and sort of like, like you can see that, that you know, second on that is the sessions. So it seems like the map is collecting the sessions and not letting them go. So, so same deal where you can actually go in you can look at the objects, you can see the size and the retain size. And this is sort of like the big, uh, you know, you can sort of like see that this is a million, um, yeah, a million bytes. So you know that the problem is with sessions. And same with, with, with uh, JitMap, you can sort of like, uh, we wanted to like explore this, we can open it in a new tab, and then you can actually go in and see the references. And you can see that there's a session, um, you know, and in the sessions, like, see, we have, doo -doo 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 -doo. we have all the information, supports so there's some attributes, and the attributes, there's a table, and all the attributes that they had. So you can still explore, same deal with, 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 with the Eclipse Matt, which I actually have to say, I usually don't use Eclipse, but I'm so curious to now, like, use it, because, like, it seems to be super, super simple, and, and, you know, a little bit more, you know, it has a little bit more tools than what I've been used to on Visual VM. Visual VM uh, gives you a very good, uh, there is uh, things that I, that, that I like about Visual VM. If you ever really need to like get real, um, real deep into like, for example, what kind of object do you want to get? There is this thing called the object query language. And that essentially lets you say like, oh, I want to find a sender session that has one of the attributes of this value. 
like you know when when you are really like like looking at at particular objects with certain properties you know the object query language will allow you to sort of like like you know nail down into those particular objects so so that is definitely one of the advantages that you get from visual vm uh, you know, or at least one of the one of the things that that Visual VM is known for. On the on on the other hand, then you also have um, same kind of tooling where you can try to um, let's go back to the summary and let's go back to the objects where you can try to see like um, doo -doo -doo -doo. if you open a new tab and you see da -da -da. there is a way to same as trying to find path to GC roots. Uh, let me see, it's probably down here. It's just that I can't see it. Object standard session class filter, same deal where you just want, let's say that you want to remove everything that is, that is, you know, what, one of the things that I like to use this is, you know, if um, Clubhouse, you know, let's say that, that I want to just limit it to my own classes because I know the problem relies on the code that I wrote, right? Um, you know, that's, that's the other thing I'll do with the filters. But, um, Oh, here they are, fields and references. Thank you. I knew you were somewhere. So, doo -doo -doo -doo, and then you can go click on references and then compute merge references. And then as it goes through, it's doing exactly the same thing where it's just trying to figure out where is my root and, and where is it going, going from, right? And um, same with the fields where you can actually see like, okay, there's the entry set and essentially, you know, like the views that we have, which hopefully at some point in time, we'll get the values. Oh, this one is, partic this particular one is empty. But yeah, so again, two tools, same flavor. Um, the, the, both of them are open source. I don't know exactly like, you know, like a visual VM if, I think it's still in, in, development in the sense that they're still actively doing it, but they did remove it from the actual, like, um, they did remove it from um, the particular uh, bundle, but they, they're still active. They're still doing Yeah, stuff. I think you can, down, you can download it. Like, there's a place for downloading. The source code is available on GitHub. Um, so you can build it. You can tweak it. Um, you know, so it, it's, it's out there for that. It's just not shipping with the JVM anymore. Yep. Is really all... Um, oh, what it is! Like they, oh, they worked together for a little bit, for a little yeah. bit, and then they, they sort of split it up. And uh, the other thing that is fun is like uh, we're not doing it here, but it does have the same ability of of uh, hooking up to a live VM running and being able to see like what's happening, just sort of like that that uh, Eclipse console where it tells you like where the GCs are and how much memory profile is being used. So it allows you to do all that. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's still very useful, still very rele relevant. I mean, you know, I, I've been using Matt now for a couple of years and I've just become used to the, um, what I like about Matt is that when it indexes things, it can get really, really fast. Whereas I know when I used J Visual VM, sometimes when I'd be doing the searches, mm, things would slow down. A while. And they would be consistently slow with, with Matt. You get the index right off the bat and it's fast. And the, the object query language, um, Matt has that as well. So you, you can <laughs> run the same queries that you run in JVisual VM in Matt. Oh, um, nice. You know, the, the kind of the thing though that you saw on my screen where it locked up is it is a JVM process just like Eclipse. So you need to set your memory accordingly with the size of your heap dumps. So a lot of times you'll need your memory settings at or around the, maybe a little bit, you can go maybe a little bit below the size of the mm. heap dump uh, because in order for it to load and parse and, and collect everything, it, it needs to put a lot of that in memory. Yep. Um, it, that's true for like most of them. Like yep. uh, same with Visual VM. Um, you need to have, um, you know, and that is something that, that, that will happen. If you, if you need to run this and let's say that you have a 25 gig, um, you know, dump and you don't have a 25 gig, you know, client computer, um, you know, like it's, you it can, takes a while. <laughs> yes. And you can still do it, 
but it will look like you're 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 you know when you're opening uh, one of these heat dumps that that your profiler you know be this Eclipse Matte or or JV should be it looks like it crashed right but it hasn't it's just that to to really read an index 25 gigs when you don't have that memory you know that that RAM available it just takes a long because it's doing a lot of this swap and trying to like figure thing out. Yeah. And with Matt, like, so again, here's, here's my Matt installation. And if, if you, it's just a zip that you unload and it is basically a version of Eclipse. If you look at the INI file, just like if you need to add more memory to Eclipse, mm-hmm. I can open this up and I can add additional heat to my Matt instance to give it more, you know, oomph to, to parse through those 24 gigabyte heap dumps when, yeah. when that comes up. So when that loads, um, I've obviously got a lot in my notepad plus plus, so it's taken a little bit. Um, <laughs> oh, there we go. But I can set the XMX settings mm-hmm. just like any other version of Eclipse to be much higher uh, to get through those. So I have a, I have a 42 gig machine. So, uh, cause I, I look at some very large heap dumps sometimes. Um, so yeah, I yeah. actually have mine set at 32 gigs by default uh, to let me tear through those. And, you know, it takes a while still, but it, um, you know, the higher memory settings does, uh, help get through those things um, so that you know with it within an hour or so <laughs> I'm ready to to provide analysis to my clients on that. Yep. Um, and, and if you're doing this often, meaning like like you are on 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 the on the hook for trying to get these, like it, there's there is really a tool for your job. Like you know, getting memory on a laptop is very cheap now. <laughs> so so you know, as the powers that be, uh, get it, and or if you're a consultant, just get a laptop with a lot of memory, like yeah. Bob does. <laughs> and, and if you can't do that, um, you know, you, you're 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 an employee, and you you get what you get and you don't get upset, um, if you have cloud, you can get a VM that can, yeah, right? so, you know, you, you can go out to your cloud, you provision, instance, your own. provision something for a few hours, um, and, and, you know, set your, get your heap to what needs to be parsed through it. And then mm-hmm. once you get your analysis, you know, once you actually get it for a mat, you could actually download it with the index and then you'd be fine running, keeping it locally with that index already built out. It's really the indexing that requires a lot of memory. Mm-hmm. Uh, so just to get back, this is my my Apache client. So if I was going to look at defaults, like, okay, here, yeah, and I got socket timeout set to 20 yep. seconds, a connection timeout, this is what I expect. But, but I may not expect lie. to see a second one. Yeah. And if that second one, oh boy, has zeros or, or you know, infinite timeouts, I may get now different behavior. Know. So, I mean, that's a case where I may think I'm getting something from a, a config server or a properties file. Um but, you know, if I looked at the code more closely, I would probably see what the problem is. But knowing that the heap dump cannot lie to me, this is always the smoking gun to say, well, we think it's working this way, but, but the heap dump says otherwise. Yep. Um, and then it's working backwards to figure out, okay, what, what did we assume was working that wasn't? And then fixing the problem. But this allowing me to navigate by going in and, and looking at those uh, outgoing references uh, allows me to to look at those things underneath it, um, look at the actual values of these uh, member variables of these classes, and see what they actually are at this point in time. Yeah, um, which is massively valuable. No, and it's it's one of those where where, where you you learn how to be humble because the <laughs> the very first time this happens, like no, I set it up. I, it's not my fault. <laughs> it's something wrong with the dump you took, and it's like yeah. no. no. <laughs> It's dumps. really not. <laughs> yeah, dumps don't lie. Heat dumps don't lie. So, so it is one of those where, where you know, like, like once you get presented with this hard evidence, something happened. Like, yep. you know, either a ROM file is being read, uh, some rogue process is starting a new a new HTTP client with defaults. But like, like you can't just like scrub it off and say like, no, the heat dump is incorrect. It's like. It's like, you know, you have to be humble enough to say like, oh, this is what really is running. This is the real values that it's taking. Let's just concentrate on figure out why did that happen? Yeah. And and as far as the object query language, again, Matt comes yeah. with a council here. It actually has help and, and OQL syntax that you can use. Um, it's basically like an SQL for the heap dump. Yep. Um, so you can work through things there. I wasn't going to actually cover it, so I don't have any queries ready. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> but you know, this is, this is where you'd be able to do that. If you're looking for that needle in the haystack uh, mm-hmm. type of situation, rather than the, the, the somewhat more obvious situations where you look and you see something like this, where it's like, yep, I think we That's know what, what the problem is, is yeah. um, within the first 30 seconds of the, the thing being parsed. Um, yeah. so yeah, no, I mean, so between both Matt and uh, visual VM, you know, you should have all the tools you need to, to debug pretty much anything that happens. And again, it is so worth taking the pause. If your VM is about to crash anyways, just, mm. just take the heap dump, give it to your developers. You will know what the problem is. Then you will not be guessing and playing, you know, the, the game where you're, you're, you're just hoping that this next change fixes the problem because you don't really know for sure. But now, now, the and cargo I, I, cultural approach, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I am so excited because, like, like chopping at the bit, I want to see the code. Yes, I, yes. I, well, I, what I, can I, the like, code be doing? But again, if you're dealing with a vendor code base, right? This may be the only thing you have. Um, there have been cases where I've gone into proprietary code bases um, without a decompiler because somebody said, "Hey, you can't use this." Where it's like, well, I can use my heap dump analysis tool and go through it. And though I can't read the code, I can tell you that your code is your doing code this. Your code is doing this. And I can see your objects that are accumulating here and what is referencing those objects and basically send that off to the vendor to say, you need to fix this. Um, and then I can decompile their code later and just not tell anyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you never heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. But yeah, no, I mean, it, it is the underutilized tool of the JBM. Thread dumps are always cheaper, uh, but yep. heap dumps, there is there is, leaves nothing so to the imagination. Yep. They'll tell you exactly what's going on. All right. But if you really want to look at the code, I mean, here's here's what I'm doing here. I mean, basically, here's your session call. Uh-huh. I've got, my session call is adding an attribute. And we can see all of these things in the heap dump without having to look at any of this code. Um, uh-huh. So, I mean, we could tell what my attribute was. We could tell that there was another hash map. We could tell that the key was a random integer and that the string was a, a random string and it was the same random string each and every time. <laughs> you know, here we, we see there's two different Rust template implementations, but we're able to ah. see that from the heap dump as well without looking at any of the code to say, well, one's behaving differently. Why would that be? If there was only a single instance of the HTTP client, they would both be behaving the same. But the fact that we found two, there could be two different uh, implementations. Two different implementations, two different settings. So I can show you guys all these things afterwards and show that you don't even need to read the code. Um, we were able yeah. to figure out all these problems without looking at any of this. Um, so no, not a whole lot of code this episode, but I hope it's, it's super useful for you to take back and uh, over the holidays, be able to, to learn about heap dumps and then, you know, solve more problems in 2021. No, and it is, it is so funny because I scroll down a little bit. I want to see even more of this session one. Sure. Yeah. And it's, and, it, and it's crazy because one of the things like, like sometimes the thing is very clear cut. It's like, Oh, here it is. Here's the map. Here's where it's going. But even if you are not sure of like, like you know, how the code is, ha- like why the code is doing what it does, just having the ability to know that, oh, it's related to the session classes. It's related to the map. It's related to when I call this particular endpoint or when I'm using this particular, you know, HTTP client, you start narrowing down, even if you need to come through the code. Because sometimes that, that will happen too, where, you're not exactly sure what's happening, but if you have the ability to narrow it down to like, look, it must be on this particular area because this is the only area that we create sessions, or this yep. is the only area that we create maps that are part part of the sessions. Yeah, and, and the, heap, the heap dump can expose things that you can't even see in the code because, I mean, here you're working with the HTTP session interface, which is, is of course, part of the servlet uh, API classes, right? So I don't actually get to see the underlying implementation until I go to my heap dump and look at my histogram to see that the standard session is how that behaves. So if you have a bug in the open source code that you're using, I can go look at this class in GitHub under the Catalina code base yeah. for Tomcat and say, well, what is standard session doing? And pe- I mean, 
again, the advantage of using open source is I can actually eventually See look it. at the code. But if I don't know what this is running on, let's say I'm just building out a war file and then it's being deployed into some container that I've never seen before. This can tell me which class that I need to be looking at because this is my running code in the container. I can say, oh, we're using Tomcat. You know, we can, we can start tracing back and figure, okay, what version of Tomcat are we on? Let's yep. look at the open source code and see if there's a bug in the open source project um, that needs to be fixed. Or maybe we're just using it in a way that is causing something bad to happen for my client code. Yep. Yep. No. So, so again, remember that heat dumps are your friend. Like, uh, like, you know, like they, they help you, you know, in, in many ways is the real like smoking gun of what, what, what happened or, 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 you know, like either on terms of, of what values objects have between, or like what are the actual GC leaks that you actually have? Like, you know, if the, who is, who's retaining references to things like all these things, uh, you know, an actual, you know, heap dump will tell you. Uh, sometimes it might not be too evident, uh, and you might need to do a little bit of sleuthing of the code, but a heat dump will help you at least trim down to where should you should be looking for, for the problem areas, you know, be this a heat dump or, or settings or whatever it is. A um, couple other things that I'll just add is that there is a section, um, there is a JVM uh, or a Java command where, where it's essentially dump on out of memory. Out of memory. Yep, which is, you know, I think it should be, you know, like as long as you have this space, you know, it's never hurts to have it. Like, you know, because essentially what, what that means is that your JVM is already crashing. The JVM is giving up. And before it gives up, it will, you know, as a last will and testament, it will give you a heap dump. Yep. And, and with that, you can, you can probably figure it out instead of doing this cat and mouse of, of, oh, look, it's trending bad. It's about to happen. Let's try to get it before it happened again, right? Like, so, so having, you know, dump, on a, a dump heap on our memory error is, is a very nice flag to always have. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the stopgap. I mean, you know, if you're doing your, your operations well, a lot of the operations folks will be telling, will already be calling you before that happens, <laughs> um, unless nobody's yes. really paying attention. Uh, but it is a good, hey, if it's happening in the middle of the night, nobody's awake, it's low, low volume and, and, and nobody's paying it attention. Just you have like, this batch process that kicks off and just runs out of memory. It. That yep. thing will, will save you having to wait until the next day. Yep. Uh, or wait until it happens again to solve it. So yeah, that's it's a, it's because that is the worst part. Yeah, that's the worst part is trying to replicate it. And it only happens at midnight just <laughs> when you're not looking, right? <laughs> Absolutely. All right. I think we covered like all this stuff on, or at least, well, we didn't cover definitely all, but, but at least, you know, enough for you to get your feet wet. I think that Bob has been dealing with a lot of like <laughs> heap, heap issues uh, after Black Friday or around yes. Black Friday. <laughs> Much less this year. It was more, more last year. <laughs> so yeah, this no. year we were more prepared, but um, yeah, when you're, when you're in this mode, being, having the skills to be able to pull this off and do it will make your, your next few yeah. days and the rest of your holiday much better. Um, oh my gosh. I still remember the best one that I had was, um, you know, like, uh, there was an out of memory that was happening on this particular application and, and I'm like, like what's going on, you know? And when we took a heap dump, I was like, we are replaying every command we ever send to the server. What do you mean we're replaying every, we're retaining every command. And, and what was, it was uh, an object output stream. And then when you use them, you know that when you're sending objects through an object output stream, most of the time to save, to save space on the wire, the object output stream will remember the objects that you sent just in case you send them again on the wire. So, so if you send the same string twice or you send the same object twice, instead of the object output stream recreating it on the other end, it would just say, oh, well, we just need a reference to the one that we already seen. But if you never cleared that cache, you effectively have a leak. And it was crazy because the only way we found out was we saw the, we saw the, uh, the, the, the heap dump and we started seeing like, look, we're replaying we, we, have a, we have a history on this map of every command we ever send. And we're like, oh, it's the output stream that is caching them. 
And then that's when we learn how to reset it, uh, you know, or to actually say, do not, do not cache the entries because each entry is going to be unique. Uh, but, but again, it, it was solved five minutes after looking at the dump. Uh, it saved, it saved, <laughs> it saved the company yep. for a little bit because we were about to be pulled out of where we were running. So, so, you know, again, keep dumps are your friend. You it's know, almost it. always a well-intended performance optimization gone wrong. Yeah, a cache yeah, without a you. TTL, a cache without a defined top yeah. size. And it made things faster for somebody, but eventually your, you your trade-off run, right? comes back to bite you. Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's it for this episode. Uh, thanks, Bob, for putting it together and, and, and taking us to a through the force of, of uh, out-of-memory exceptions because those are always, you know, again, scary at the beginning but if you happen to have a heat dump you will find a solution so that you always you always have that on your mind now that they, they are your friends and they, they help you out um and that's it thanks everybody for all listening right. cheers welcome off. to 2021 everyone Bob yeah. signing off. all right you know follow us at java pop house all right take care everyone cheers all right all right we did it. We did. All right, let me stop. And...